campus in San Francisco. It's the Cube covering Apache Sparkmaker community event brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. And welcome back to the Galvanized campus here in San Francisco as we continue our coverage of the Cube of the Apache Sparkmaker community event. Along with George Gilbert, I'm John Walls, and we're joined here at Galvanize with a, a couple of guests, one from IBM, Joe Horowitz, who's the Director of Strategy and Business Development for our IBM Analytics. And mm -hmm. Joel, thanks for being with us. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. And uh, joining him to his left, Shri Ambadi, who's the CEO of H2O. And Shri, thank you for the thank, time. Thank you for We appreciate me. that. Joel, let's, let's jump in. Uh, we haven't talked much yet today, I don't think, George, about machine learning. Hmm. And uh, integral piece, obviously, in the Spark ecosystem. But, but from the IBM point of view, machine learning, uh, not only where is it today, but what do you see the growth potential and, and what's the necessary commitment yeah. you're going to have to have to really make that take off? Yeah, I mean, well, we're lucky because we have an expert like Shri here today who can tell us a lot more than I could about machine learning. So that's, that's, uh, that's good. Um, from the IBM side, I mean, clearly it's having an impact across all of our business units. Um, you know, clearly the ability for, you know, enterprise applications to have the ability to learn and to interpret um, their environments is bringing, you know, huge value to our clients. All right. And then, Shri, why don't you, if you could, just from a 30,000 foot level right now, because this is what you do, you know, obviously at H2O, uh, but what are you seeing in terms of what's happening in your market? We are busy debunking the experts. You mentioned the word experts. The money ball for business is on, right? And the money ball is basically, there is no expert, data is the expert. Mm. And in many ways, data and analysis, data science, has transformed lots of our businesses and they're finding value not just in their vertical but in a horizontal they're building around the data and the community they have built. Mm. And they're trying to defend that community with beautiful data products and that's kind of where the revolution ahead is for. And the whole data transformation is bringing AI to a wider audience by making AI part of every software element out there. It's, it's certainly coincidental you brought up Moneyball, where here we are in the Bay Area, and Billy Bean in Oakland yeah. is you know, just across one of the bridges here, yeah. who was going to be the originator of that. We, we talk about this, this shift into a horizontal uh, mm. and, and rather than vertical. So, uh, I mean, what's happening then in terms of, of those sectors, in terms of mm. those markets? I mean, who's, who's more involved with data now that wasn't maybe five, ten years ago? Mm. So the value chain, I mean, the values have shifted from physical assets to digital assets, to kind of virtual mm. assets. There's a substantial delinking between Airbnb is more valuable than all the hotels put together. Mm. Uber is more valuable than GM and all the car, car companies and even Tesla. Mm. And why? And the answer is that they're able to come, like truly bring data to community and build a real trust based ecosystems around the core product they have. So it's no longer about product value, it's about ecosystem value. How can you bring external interactions into your company so you can take advantage of the data you have and build a wider ecosystem? And I think that's kind of the true thesis of how data is able to touch not just your vertical, but all the sub, like the, uh, the adjacent verticals that you have in the core business. So if you're an insurance company, you can be informing car companies, you can be informing health companies. You converge all these different siloed verticals into a very, how can I make life better uh, mindset? And I think that's kind of where we're seeing, we're seeing transformation. I mean, software was the original horizontal, but even software companies, mm -hmm. much like IBM and others, are building verticals where they can go really up the chain, solve problems, not just sell technologies. I just want to add to that, Ben, if I may. Sure. Um, I just signed up for uh, new insurance yesterday, and as I'm, you know, going through that application process, all online, not even talking to anyone. You know, there's a little checkbox. Like if you own, you know, a smartphone, you install their app, and they'll automatically, you know, discount because they can track your driving, and they can use things like machine learning to basically tell and predict, frankly, if you're going to be a good driver, bad driver. Um, so that was like where, you know, some of these things, like I think. A lot of folks have like looked way out like five or 10 years and say, gosh, you know, that AI thing is coming. It's scary. You know, let's set up a whole organization to protect us from this scary thing. Mm -hmm. And I think many people don't realize like this is here now. This is happening today. 
you may not even realize it. And in fact, I think a large, at least a, a big part of this is frankly personalizing experiences for people. I think that's actually to me where I've experienced it personally is actually making me have a more intimate relationship with these, you know, uh, with these verticals. Yeah, I think like the Waze app is something that comes to mind when you talk about that. That was what my kind of my aha moment mm -hmm. was when it started. And I realized that it's, are you going home now? Are you driving to work now? Are you doing this now? Are you going to see your mother? Whatever it is, yeah. you know. It's, and and now it's obviously looking at my behavior and my my patterns and whatever. And, and so we're seeing that tree that not just in in transportation but in retail behavior or might be uh, uh, even maybe in the intelligence community, whatever it is, we're seeing uh, or or. I don't know, we're, we're and gathering healthcare. and healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, being able to predict outcomes more successfully, uh, dependent upon the kind of food I consume or what condition I'm in. Are you seeing, you know, are those all these things happening right now? They are. I mean, in many ways, what's happening is the bar, so what open source, we think about Apache mm -hmm. Spark, we're in the open source um, uh, conference that's uh, coming together. Apache Spark, Apache Hadoop, the whole open source Linux in the original ways, Google, mm. have really lowered the bar for building applications and building code. Code is a commodity. So what people used to think of their core values, their code or their data, mm. I think what is really uh, people are trying to do is defend their brand and defend their kind of truly their community. So if mm. you can defend your community with the data and the technologies you have and serve them very well, they will like they will grow profound love for your brand and love for your uh, for you as a company, yeah. and that's what's really making people go into the twenty second like twenty twenty, as opposed to think about twenty twenty sixteen and today and here and now. AI is here to actually make us be more human, mm. so you can actually let the the rule based machines go away mm. to more pattern recognition based machines that can truly commodify like truly make all the boring stuff we do day to day mm. completely aside and you focus on the stuff that actually matters, which is get emotional reaction from your customers. Sri, you're heading in a direction that's really interesting. We spoke, uh, the first, the first uh, interview we did was with Derek Shuttle, who's in charge of uh, analytic data services, or I guess more, yep. more broadly. Uh, yeah, he's the GM of our analytic portfolio. Yeah. Analytic portfolio. And he laid out a vision where he said, we're not, um, the world's moving away from product silos. We're orchestrating you know, mm -hmm. a bunch of services. And then we're also bringing together a whole lot of data and analytic feeds and cataloging them mm. the way 10 years ago we might have cataloged you know, a software marketplace. Mm. But I wanted to ask you, based on what Since you were data saying. Data lines and microservices. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, one line. Yeah. So for the, for the consumer of this, I don't mean mm. the person, I mean the, the company, mm -hmm. where is the value now? Is it in a combination of the the proprietary data, external data that adds context, and then the machine learning algorithms that they all mix in one proprietary ball. Where is value for the customer the same way that Derek described it for the vendor? Mm. So, the, so the, the long end of this is how do we improve lives? How do we save lives in healthcare? How do we you know, truly have an impact on time? Time is only non-renewable resource, right? So data is where, so today Google has 359 degrees view of the world, as they say, right? So they have the whole, almost the full view of the world. So what companies today of, and we were speaking to a few customers as we speak, like Progressive or Capital One or PricewaterCoopers, they have their customer data that they are not allowed to share, right? Now if you can build data alliances where you're not sharing data but sharing models and improving each other's models to serve the same customer better, to find vendors who pay on time, for example, or to find um, the, the anti-money laundering where you can come together to fight something that's bigger. Uh, or cancer, which is even bigger, how do you come together as a society to put the best brains in one place to solve something substantial, which will kill one of us, one in four of us will get cancer. So we tr try to truly elevate the problem to how does it touch lives? And that includes algorithms, data, the best practices in each of these spheres. You want the best doctor to mm -hmm. be kind of captured as an AI program. You want the best radiologist, the best um, like physicist. You want to capture the best of practices as a true pattern recognized model 
that you can reuse individually in each verticals and horizontally across verticals. So let me chime in here yeah. a bit, because what there's been a few things that we, I, we've heard, right? So one is what Shri mentioned earlier is this idea of an open platform, right? That Derek mentioned earlier today, and what I would say that our partnership is really, you know, based on Apache Spark, Apache Hadoop, H2O. They're all open source projects. Not only are they open source, there's no lock-in. So any, so the, and then the second piece is, is this idea of an abstraction layer from data in the form of a machine learning algorithm, which is transferable, which is I think Shree's point, reusable to other right. industries. And so that's how you remove that kind of you know, that, that, you know, connection back to the data. But there are a lot of, you know, look, there, there were certain companies that made news um, this last week that are also here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of clients left because, frankly, there's a lot of businesses out there right now that, frankly, are serving, like, these proprietary stacks and charging a lot of money for them. Right. And so, you know, our vision of the future is, you know, and that's a big reason why we, you know, contributed system ML, which was a proprietary piece that Watson's built on um, is because our belief is that, you know, this needs to be an open framework for anyone, whether it's H2O or Google TensorFlow or any of these libraries that exist for people to come together and then the whole thing will lift up as opposed to having these like siloed, you know, More use cases and, and riffing off of that. When you see a big company, let's say Walgreens or a CVS or, or even a Progressive or a Liberty Mutual or a Capital One or a JP Morgan or an Amex, they are spending billions of dollars every year on software. And they actually, frankly, are a very massive software operation as a back end in the back office. Mm. But historically, they were consumers of software. Mm. When you're a consumer of software, it is in the interest of the vendor that you're not very well educated. When you are actually a maker of software, it is in the interest of the community of the software providers to educate you the most. Mm -hmm. So open source is about a maker culture. So you're making software, and we are infecting that culture not just to us, but to other software companies, powerhouses like IBM, which have, like they've started software in the hundreds of years ago, right, sort of many ways. And so you have IBM, Microsoft, Google, truly embracing open source for the first time ever. And that's actually a very fundamental change. Amazon as well, they've open sourced the deep learning recently. So what you're seeing now is the ability, of the, the need for building ecosystems of software makers. And that's coming into the verticals, into traditionally companies that did not think they were software companies. Mm. So I think that's the bigger change that's happening where four years ago they would ask us, how will you make money if you're open source? Mm -hmm. I think four years from now they'll ask you, how will you make money from software in general? Mm -hmm. Whether it's open or closed, because the money in the actual code has become a commodity truly, so the money isn't actually the value of the stack. And that's kind of where it goes back to your question. Okay, so let me, let me add or let me, let me try and clarify one thing. So assume the regular, um, the traditional enterprise app that's coded, you know, it has its infrastructure, it has its, you know, business process rules. Um, and now we want to share these models, but the models, so much of the work in making them work is in tying them to the data. And the, the specific, the yes, context. the context, and that's, different across companies. Yeah. So how do you, how do you make that a f f relatively friction-free? It's, it's a good question. I think the API economy is here, right, sort of. And so truly the data products of today are going to have more APIs to become almost like a pipe in the grand scheme of many operations in a pipeline. But if you think about deep learning, uh, it has for the first time ever pickled how people look at uh, look at things. So the vision deep learning that's used to identify cats can be, it, it actually does edge detection, so you can actually detect edges anywhere. So you can actually use it to predict what is the name of, the, what is the name of this carpet. So that cat model is useful after all. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and yeah. so all of ImageNet has led to kind of this uh, like embracing of deep learning and explosion in deep learning. You can actually predict what shingle of the roof using mm -hmm. the same kind of model. So, and then use that to predict how long it's, the roof is going to be there. And so the insurance companies can suddenly start using, replace this roof instead of waiting for the catastrophe to happen. But will the insurance company have their own deep learning so model? So the bigger, or, or there's a bigger question. Subscribe? There's okay. a bigger question. Okay. So the, the challenge isn't so much that, you know, we're, how do you apply arguably the model to, 
different data sets. I think that's being sorted out. I actually think the bigger challenge is, frankly, a lot of the data that exists is dark, meaning it's paper-based, frankly. And it's not even digital today. And I think digital is often used synonymously with marketing. That's not what we talk about when we say digital. It's actually this, I mean, you know, you have a notepad there, right? I mean, I can't, you know, do anything with that until you digitize it in some way. Take a picture and we can or run a model on it. Or you whiteboards every day. Right? <laughs> you got to point out them right? old fashioned guy. No, I don't have to, I'm just saying, like, so that's, you know, that's where we'll get to. And so a lot of the business that's conducted today is still very much paper-based and it's not digital. So, you know, there's not a lot or you can do with that. Or yeah. completely Audio, human. video, video. Yeah. But I think, the, I, think the, I think the crux of your question is there's lots of reusability. Much like reusable patterns, there are design patterns in classifying, mm. design patterns in fraud, design patterns in highly unbalanced data sets that can be reused. Templates that are used to win a Kaggle contest to do A can be transferable to similar to A problem, right, A prime. So, some, so the next problem, so zip codes. For example, if you understood zip codes very well, you can reuse zip codes everywhere. If you understand weather patterns, you can apply that everywhere else. Okay. So there's some core components that you can productize, and then there are components that you compose. Okay, at the risk of descending back into the, you know, nitty gritty, um, take weather because that is a service now weather you know prediction is a service <laughs> that's obviously <laughs> not something where we're going to pass a model around that is an api I well i mean there's uh, Shri is exactly right there's okay. design patterns right and i think what we're announcing today yeah. right and you'll hear later today um, is our data science experience. And working with you know, H2O's community, I mean, a lot of the learnings aren't happening you know, in the ivory towers really anymore. They're happening in the field. Um, and people are sharing at meetups. They're sharing just kind of through word of mouth. And I think a lot of the work that we have to do is frankly sharing these design patterns between not just like hardcore machine learning engineers and data scientists, but even like, you know, everyday people should be able to at least like, cog you know, cognitively understand, you know, what a clustering algorithm means, what classification means. Like, I think that's where I get excited because there's a lot of like, we're here in Galvanize and their mission is, you know, is to, is really to, um, to teach people not necessarily how to like, you know, do research and development, but frankly, how do I apply data science to, and that's, I think, where they've actually, you know, differentiated themselves quite a bit. But it is going to be delivered as applications, microservices, yep. kind of data products. So the APIs, uh, several of these APIs compose and eventually become applications on your dashboard that you're looking at. If you're a CXO today, you don't have the time to look at all the vital signs of your company. How do I condense that to a score? How do I condense that to the score that matters? Mm -hmm. Like we as often now have plots that show dollar value to the severity of the score, because you're not necessarily worried about the most dangerous one that's not so important sometimes, or the most dangerous one that's also important. So I think kind of looking at kind of relevance, so, so going back to your context setting, the context comes from who the end user is, mm. from the user experience. And if the user is a consumer, he has a different context. He's flying frequently, he wants to know which is the best path to optimize, mm. right? Sort of. and, and you want to go to a travel location where you don't want to come back from. Right? How do you find that? That's kind of the <laughs> goal for airlines <laughs> companies should be, right? Let me know when you get there, okay. <laughs> but that's, you would I mean, not hear from me, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. She's on a very good point. So to your point, I mean, yeah. people consume things differently. Some people listen better. Some people are more visual. Some people like to read things. Some people are tactile. So I, I think we shouldn't limit ourselves in terms of how will people consume data some products. Some people game, play games, and some people yeah. are immersive. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next... Next bend in this corner is immersive intelligence. Mm. VR. And, and we are yeah. looking at some of those yeah. improvements as well. Before uh, we let you take off, uh, Joel mentioned you're wearing galvanized. Um, you're sitting next to a guy wearing a long sleeve t-shirt and, <laughs> um, and with a company that has put all the chips in the table on open source. I mean, what does it say to you as a partner about kind of IBM and, and their culture, their mindset in general? I feel days? like I'm on exhibition here. <laughs> <laughs> on it looks good, it yeah, looks good, you, but, but just in general. I mean, it's a different feel, is it not? 
It's powerful, right? It's, it's kind of the, uh, if you think about when uh, Joel wrote, wrote a blog and Katie Nuggets a few years ago about R versus popularity of R versus like SaaS and other closed source ecosystems. And it's really interesting to see that R Python have really like as open source movements brought data science to life in some degree. And now when bigger companies are embracing them, they're bringing a lot, lot more real software experience into it and channels of distribution. And we as software companies, traditional startup community-based open source companies are looking at bigger companies now voting on open source. There are a lot more movements that can be started and a lot more bridges can be built, a lot more ecosystems to be actually truly thrived. So how do you build ecosystems in an open source? I used to call it biz dev in the land of open source, is you actually take Spark put H2O in it and call it sparkling water, right? So that's exactly <laughs> the product we have, right? And that, and that was actually the first of a movement which kind of Silicon Valley really was like charmed by that whole boom and where historically you'd have two open source projects, Cassandra and Hedgebase, both I represent Apache Cassandra at the time, they would really f like go to like little uh, limits to, f to, to show right. off each other's strengths right. and, and actually the, some of the parts is actually less than the whole. And if you can build yeah. an ecosystem where you try to raise a forest, not a tree, right? Yeah. And a forest that is really like a real tropical forest, very rich, some people are good at the, at the birds, some of people, some some uh, some other trees are good at just giving lots of grass and and food and sunlight. So, all of that builds a very thriving ecosystem. I think what we are seeing now is a multipolar software world, which is great. Multipolar, like you have Apple, you have Google, you have Amazon, you have IBM, you have like all these really cool thriving ecosystems. But also the next level of what I call the integrated platforms, the software platforms were always there. What we're seeing now is giant platforms that are integrated, an Uber or Airbnb, they are examples of these, or a Predix, GE, they are integrated vertical platforms that can now connect much more community, much more larger base. So you're going from just pure, uh, I'm a product company to I'm a platform company looking for ecosystem mm. to an integrated platform company which can really bring value. Mm. I think these are the multi levels of growth that's happening that we're seeing and, and that's amazing to have people like IBM, Microsoft has also embraced open source. We're seeing Google opening opening up and historically like you never seen this happen before. So it's yeah, I think we're I think we're no longer living in a winners take all society, mm -hmm. frankly. I think that there's plenty, it's not you know, who has the best mousetrap will win anymore, it's who builds the best alliances, is you know, who builds the best solutions that solves the client's you know, most you know, burning problems. That's who will win. And so I think you know, you know, Shri is you know, exemplary of that, of, of putting clients first, um, as is IBM. And I think ultimately that's gonna be the differentiator, not the technology, not the stack, because that's becoming a commodity, frankly. It is really about trust. Right, sort of. Right. When we are building verticals in CFO for CFOs, for example, and historically, which company had the best trust of CFOs? IBM, right, mm -hmm. as a technology company. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're working with PwC on that front to get to the other side, but on the business side. But truly, as a technology company, you need to be building trust continuously. Whether it's trust with this man, the, with the man in the meetup mm -hmm. who's arguing with you on why A, A should be done, not B, or mm -hmm. trust on this panel or trust across different parts of your customer base, different parts of your partner base. And that's crucial. I mean, that's crucial for machine learning. Think about it. We're going into away from rule base where you can finally check, you know, okay, we're making this decision, you know, you have all these routes, to a very gray area where you may not know why, you know, an algorithm is telling you something. You don't see all the, you know, different things, all the, you know, millions of features that it took into account. You're just saying, okay, this is what it's telling me, and I have to interpret it now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for to Shri's point, if there's no trust there, then people are going to look at it and they're going to go, I'm not going to like bet my business on this. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, so that's it's a lot of tooling that needs to be invented for building that trust for AI. So all this, so there's lots of work to be done, and that's where having soft, big software vendors come in and say, hey, we're going to build a database for AI, AI DB, mm -hmm. with all the same kind of trace logs, with all the same kind of why did this model go into production? The model governance mm -hmm. becomes a real. How do you manage models? It's the same. It's as difficult as managing humans, which is very hard, oh, the, right? Sort of gov governance is no longer what who touched the data and did what to it. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a matter of how did we arrive at this decision? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a consensus. 
and, and actually, more importantly, different hospitals and different banks are trying to come together without sharing data, but share models and fight difficult to, to trace diseases, difficult to trace habits, behaviors, user-based be analytics, and it goes back to where Joel started with, personalization, almost hyper-personalization. Mm -hmm. There are five billion, six billion people on this planet, can I personalize every service he needs mm -hmm. to the point where he's as happy as God. Or she, well, or she needs. That's right. right. <laughs> we are talking about a collaborative spirit that is certainly alive and well and is yeah. driving this community forward. And uh, we really appreciate the time for both of you. And I know it was a very busy day yeah. uh, to spend with us and talk about that. Great. Joel, Shree, thank you. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thank you for having us here. More on the queue right yeah. after this. Yeah.